Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Mikey Mhenna. I'm the executive director of Afikra, and I'm happy to see you all here. Um, it is my honor to introduce our special guest. Paul Salem is the president of the Middle East Institute. He focuses on issues of political change, transition, and conflict, as well as the regional and international relations of the Middle East. Prior to being at MEI, Salem was the founding director of the Carnegie Middle East Center in Beirut uh, between 2006 and 2013. From, 90, from 99 to 2006, he was the director of the Fetis Foundation and in 1989 to 1999, founded and directed the Lebanese Center for Policy Studies, LCPS, Lebanon's leading policy think tank. Paul is the author and, and editor of numerous books, including Escaping the Conflict Trap, Towards Ending Civil Wars in the Middle East, Winning the Battle, Losing the War, Addressing the Conditions that Fueled Armed Non-State Actors, From Chaos to Cooperation Towards Regional Order in the Middle East, Broken Orders, The Causes and Consequences of Arab Uprising, Thinking Arab Futures, Drivers, Scenarios, and Strategic uh, Choices for the Arab World, among others. Paul is also a musician and composer of Arabic Brazilian jazz. His music can be found on iTunes. He completed his BA, his master's, and his PhD at Harvard University. And uh, we are honored to have him on Africa Conversations. Paul, thank you so much for joining. Uh, thank you, Mikey. It's a pleasure and an honor. Mikey, I've known you since you were a little kid, I guess is, uh, is true. the case. Yeah. But you've uh, blossomed into uh, a, a fantastic adult. And uh, this is really a great initiative. Thank I'm you. I'm thrilled to be here. Our time is limited. So other than saying I'm thrilled and ready to go, back to you. Great. I wish my hair would have blossomed as much as my career, but that's a, a conversation for another day. Um, so I want to talk to you uh, to start off this conversation focusing on um, the last thing I said. You did your uh, bachelor's, master's, and PhD, what about, right? One after another. And you went directly into the world of policy. And not all teenagers are interested in policy. And so I'm curious, how quickly into your life did you think, I want to uh, research the history of uh, political uh, political science and policy making in the region? Uh, well, it's interesting. I wasn't really interested in policy or politics, but I grew up in Lebanon during the Civil War, uh, and I was a successful student. So whereas most of my colleagues would think of, you know, either becoming doctors or engineers or go into business, you know, growing up in the middle of a civil war, I thought, you know, what is most needed? And I concluded, well, what's most needed is political order, uh, political development, uh, uh, and that politics, while maybe not my, my, my love or something that I would like to do, I'd rather be doing music or philosophy, but that it, somebody needs to do that and that a lot of people need to be interested in politics and policy uh, in order for our country, for Lebanon at the time where I was, to find peace. And I think, you know, the events of the last couple of years only underline that even more, that no matter how successful you are in business or engineering, if you don't get the, the politics right and the policy right, uh, you're going to lose everything. So I really went into... I mean, I did my BA in philosophy and music, which is what I loved most. But then I, you know, then I began to decide what well, I better focus on politics and policy, because it's what's needed. And I think a lot of young Lebanese today are realizing that, you know, the political sphere cannot be left alone. Uh, it's too important. Yeah. Uh, and if anything, it's more important than medicine and engineering and business, because as Ar Aristotle said, it's in a way the mother of all uh, disciplines or mother of all achievements. If you have a good political system, good society, then it's much easier to do everything else. So I'm curious, do you feel that, this might be jumping the gun a little bit, but do you feel like we suffer from um, a lack of good political ideas in the region or is it just a lack of good implementation? Because the word think tank, includes thinking in, right? Like, it's like where ideas come. But do we, do we lack ideas? I feel like we have a lot of good ideas already. We don't lack ideas. If, I feel like we lack implementation. Well, the region obviously is, com is 
extremely different, you know, yeah. with different problems in different places. If you look at Lebanon, which was largely, you know, a fairly free uh, place, there's elections, there's, you know, the possibility to, to have elite rotation and so on. I think when you look at the last 30 years, um, that there wasn't much political engagement from, I don't know what you want to call it, the middle class, the upper middle yeah. class, the bourgeoisie, uh, including the smaller bourgeoisie. And I think people were happy to go along with the status quo as long as life was okay, the economy was okay. And we woke up 30 years later realizing that we should have done much more. In Lebanon, at least, you know, largely, if you organize, if you mobilize, uh, if you vote, if you run for elections, you know, unlike in Egypt or unlike in many Arab countries, uh, there is more, more possibility in Lebanon for that. Uh, so I would say in the Lebanese case, uh, the society has really not done its duties in terms of, uh, of, of, of producing political leadership, political parties, uh, and managing its own affairs. In that uh, sphere, ideas is part of it, certainly, uh, and that's what think tanks do. But direct political engagement is more important. Uh, and part of that is civil society, protest, and so on. But in a country which actually has elections, uh, it's electoral politics that is also extremely important. And if you don't win in electoral politics uh, and somebody else wins, then you know they call the shots. Again, that's super relevant in Lebanon today, which in principle should hold elections uh, next uh, next May, but A, those elections might not happen, uh, and B, even if they do happen, how much change will happen, how much will society produce new leaders is a good question. So I want to talk about MEI, um, and we'll come back to Lebanon and the sort of the future that, uh, the immediate future that we, we may be experiencing, but MEI is a uh, an American institution. It's based in D.C., um, it's been around 75 years, was founded in 1946, but it's an American, uh, it's an American institution focused on the Middle East. When you joined MEI, um, how did that sort of shift your own, your own vantage point to start thinking about who MEI's audience is versus some of the other institutions that you've worked for? Well, MEI has changed tremendously in the last five, six years. Uh, and I would say MEI today is a is, an, is a kind of a partnership institution between okay. between the Middle East and the United States. Yeah. Uh, uh, in a way, it's a little bit like AUB, if you want. You know, yes, it's an American institution, but it is in fact a uh, a partnership, a merger, whatever you want to call it. And what do I mean by that? I mean for uh, a lot of our Experts and professionals are from the region. The president, myself, is, is Lebanese, yeah. uh, dual national. I have U.S. citizenship as well, but I'm Lebanese. Our Turkish expert is Turkish. Our Iranian expert is Iranian. You know, our Egyptian expert is Egyptian. Our Palestinian yeah. expert, and so on. Uh, it's also increasingly reflected, increasingly in our board of governors and in our international advisory council, and so on. So, really, I look at MEI as different from other think tanks in Washington, D.C. Almost all the other think tanks are American, it's really American institutions looking at the Middle East. Yeah. No, MEI is an American Middle Eastern institution looking together at, uh, look, you know, Middle East looking at America, trying to understand America, and America trying to understand the Middle East and uh, looking uh, for areas of common values, common interest, yeah. uh, and building on the idea of partnership with the overall goals of uh, you know, peace, not war, democracy, not dictatorship, social justice, women's empowerment, not patriarchy. And so those would be sort of the guiding uh, values. Uh, that's also reflected in our big uh, arts program. We have an arts program uh, where we we have a big art gallery. We bring contemporary artists from the Middle East to Washington and the U.S. For example, right now, we have an amazing exhibit of contemporary Syrian artists reflecting 
on the displacement, the civil war, what's happened in Syria over the last 10 years. We had a Kurdish art exhibit, again, very powerful, had a Palestinian art exhibit. So uh, we do a lot with art, culture, music uh, to indicate, to get beyond the headlines, get beyond the politics. Yeah. And also, and I might say, yeah. uh, for decades, been teaching the languages. You know, we teach Arabic, Farsi, uh, Kurdish, Turkish, yeah. uh, languages of the region. So if I look at, you know, um, I'm curious about, um, I was going to ask you, so the mission statement, let me actually read the mission statement. It says to increase knowledge of the Middle East among citizens of the United States and to promote a better understanding between the peoples of uh, these two areas. But when you look at this map, it's not really two areas. The Middle East is a multitude of areas to, in and of itself. Um, is, the, is the center or is the Institute concerned with or thinking about building um, understanding within the Middle East across these sort of sub areas? Is that part of the mandate or is it really the US and the Middle East as a whole? Uh, well, the answer is, is yes. And we, you know, we are concerned and we do a lot in the, I mean, first of all, yes, it is concerned with the US and the Middle East. That's obvious. And that exchange, yeah, that's, yeah. as you say, the Middle East is a region, America is a continent. It's huge. Yeah. Uh, and it's currently, you know, if you were living here, it, it's, more, <laughs> it's a multitude of regions as well. <laughs> multitude of, uh, if you go to Florida, it's nothing like New York. So, but anyway, uh, but we also do a lot uh, in the region. For example, we have a track two uh, program. It's called the I think conflict resolution and track two uh, mediation program. Among the efforts that we've been doing there for many years, we hold meetings among that bring together Iranian, Turkish, Arab uh, experts, uh, advisors, and so on to meet quietly uh, about uh, potential cooperation between Iran, you know, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Turkey, Iraq, uh, and to look for ways to get away from conflict and get towards peace. Uh, we have a, a very strong Palestine program headed by uh, a uh, good friend, uh, Khalid al-Gindi, uh, which is a Palestine and Palestine-Israeli affairs, which is really looking, obviously, at potentials for peace, two-state solution, uh, stuff like that. Uh, just this morning, I had meetings with the Greek ambassador and the Cypriot ambassador, who are very concerned about instability in the Eastern Mediterranean and how to, uh, you know, try to de-escalate the tensions, particularly with Turkey. We have a very active Turkey program. We have contacts with the Turkish government uh, in order to s bring more stability to the Eastern Mediterranean, which would promote uh, better uh, offshore gas you know, exploitation, as well as renewable energy uh, for the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, so definitely uh, a lot of our work is uh, within the region. For uh, Again, to give you another example, we have an ongoing effort uh, uh, you know, that involves Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia. Actually, one of our board members, uh, who used to be ambassador to Lebanon, Jeffrey Feltman, uh, was named a couple of months ago as the special envoy from the U.S. to work on the Ethiopia, Sudan, Egypt uh, crisis on the Renaissance Dam to try to avoid conflict in, between Egypt and the Horn of Africa. Yeah. Uh, we will so, have a lot of work on how to try to end this, the Yemeni civil war, how to de you know de-escalate the civil war in Syria and Libya and Afghanistan. So yeah, we have 19 different programs. So there's yeah. there's a lot going on. It's huge. So I have two questions real quick, and then I want to start uh, focusing on your scholarship. One is the map that I'm looking at right here is more expansive than the sort of standard boilerplate Middle East map. Um, can you walk us through a little bit of why that decision was taken to expand um, the Balkans, um, parts of Central Europe, um, uh, parts of, you know, uh, Somalia, Ethiopia, that may not be considered parts of the Middle East uh, by other standards, Central Asia? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously the core is uh, the Middle East. When MEI was established uh, in 1946, so 75 years ago, they they considered Afghanistan and Pakistan, you know, in the name nomenclature of the time, part of the mm -hmm. Middle East. So 
from Morocco to Afghanistan, Pakistan, including Turkey and the Arab countries uh, and, and Israel after 1948, I suppose, uh, was part of MEI kind of normal sort of wider Middle East. Uh, we added the Horn of Africa just recently, actually last year, because of the obvious uh, interconnection between what's happening in Ethiopia uh, and uh, Sudan and Egypt, that that is something, you know, indivisible. Uh, and you add to that that the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey also are now very involved in the Horn of Africa. Uh, we added uh, sort of what you see north of Turkey there, uh, which is the Black Sea countries. We added them a couple of years ago because uh, there too, it was very difficult to understand sort of Turkish concerns and Black Sea issues without also having an idea yeah. of what's going on in the Black Sea region, what's happening, what's happening with Russia. Uh, uh, so uh, we also launched a program there. This very morning, as I said, I was meeting with the Greek and Cypriot ambassadors. Uh, we were discussing about probably launching an Eastern Mediterranean initiative uh, yeah. Because obviously, you know, I mean, while you try to put things in a box, like this is the Middle East and this is Europe and this is, you know, uh, uh, in fact, everything's interconnected. Yeah. And obviously, uh, the offshore gas issue, uh, the conflict in Cyprus, the conflict in Libya has made the Eastern Mediterranean a very big part of the Middle East and trying to understand what's happening in the Middle East. So we're actually probably going to launch an Eastern Mediterranean initiative, which would include Cyprus, Greece, and Italy, as well as the North African countries. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, so um, MEI at 75, if you think about MEI at 125, um, what are sort of the major measures of success that you, that you as an institution think about? You know, the board of trustees, when they think about the reason for existence for this institution, what would success look like for this institution 50 years down the line? And how, how is that success really measured? Uh, well, uh, there was uh, there's an initiative out of the University of Pennsylvania called the Global Think Tank Initiative, I think something like that. And yeah. uh, they recently, recently asked a number of think tank presidents to contribute chapters to a book about the future of think tanks. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a chapter about artificial intelligence and the future of think tanks. Uh, uh, obviously, artificial intelligence is beginning already uh, to to you know make inroads into certain sectors. Uh, you know, in a few years, you probably won't be seeing a doctor. You will be consulting your app, yep. uh, uh, engineering, uh, law. Many professions are going to be invaded by artificial intelligence. And in that article, I say, I think think tanks have some time. Uh, you know, hard to say how much time they have, 10 years, 15 years. <laughs> Seriously, before, yeah. I mean, what are think tanks? They are human brains looking at information and data and development and trying to understand them as best they can. And according to certain parameters, like stability, peace, good governance, social justice, trying to make recommendations to governments, which have priorities and data and issues that limit that as well, so it's really a serious question that in 20 or 25 years, it's possible that artificial intelligence would be doing a better job than any think tank could. Let me put that aside, although that's yeah. a very serious concern and say maybe in 10 years, what would success uh, look like? I would already say that, I mean, I feel that MEI has come a long way and is already being quite successful, quote unquote, in what a think tank can do. At the end of the day, the think tank is only a think tank. Mm -hmm. It's not a government. Uh, it cannot make decisions at itself. It's not a business. It can't make money, so you can't measure it that way. What it can do is uh, uh, try its best to influence policy debates so that when people discuss policy, they discuss it according to parameters that have been produced by think tanks, and then engage directly with governments in order to actually impact, influence policy. Yeah. You can't make policy, but you can influence it. And I would take an example of Lebanon policy. Sure. We have a new Lebanon program that was launched last year, uh, and we've been very active. We just had a, a two-week uh, conference on Lebanon, and it's all available on our website. It was obviously a webinar. Uh, and we've been very closely engaged uh, with colleagues in Lebanon, but also 
with the U.S. administration and Congress, along with Lebanese American groups here. And I say we've, I would say we've been very effective as much as a think tank can in informing and impacting U.S. policy towards Lebanon. I give that as an example uh, of success. So I would say success in general would be to have that kind of impact in a sustained and a broad sense. Uh, yeah. to be able to uh, uh, have impact on policy, not only with the U.S. government, but also governments in the region. As I said, we've had contacts, you know, we meet Jawad Zarif, the Iranian foreign minister, when he's in town. We're hosting the Palestinian prime minister next week. Uh, you know, we're involved with a lot of the governments in the region. Uh, so the degree that we can influence things and that we can influence things in a good direction towards... Yeah de-escalation, peace, uh, better governance, uh, social justice and empowerment, then we would say, hey, we're doing pretty well as a think tank. Are, is there a way, and this might be really a really simple question, but is there a way that uh, MEI actually tracks that success? I mean, when a policy a proposal goes through or a new law is proposed or something gets pushed, is there a way that you as, a, as an office are saying our DNA is in that is in that law. Our DNA is in that proposal. That was us that helped uh, incept that idea. Um, how do you yeah. how do you track that? Well, I mean, all think tanks have this uh, question. It's a good question. The the answer is you have to measure it at several levels. I mean, the most success is when, as you say your idea becomes policy or becomes a law and, and you know, comes out in an official statement or something like that. And that, yeah. that has happened on Lebanon policy. Uh, our Syria program uh, has very much influenced uh, Secretary Blinken and the effort to maintain humanitarian support to, you know, Syrian refugees and so on. Uh, so there, when you're successful at the highest level, you can see it. Uh, and it's kind of, case by case, you know, it's a, it's a story. Uh, uh, but below that, you need to measure, because you, you don't always have that level of success. Underneath yeah. that, what you measure is how, how much output are you putting out? How good is it? And those, I mean, how much is, is an objective uh, measurement? How good is it is a subjective measurement. Yeah. Uh, and how much engagement are you having with policymakers? In other words, are you seeing them? Are you meeting them? Uh, sometimes you meet with them, so you've done your job, but they don't adopt your idea. You know, they're the decision maker, you're not. So, so I would say, yes, there are ways to measure all of that, uh, uh, but it is multi-layered, it's a bit complicated, and you're not yeah. always, uh, it's not a push button success. Okay, I wanna, um move on and, uh, and sort of at least uh, end our conversation, uh, our initial conversation about MEI and uh, by asking you to sort of contrast um, these three in institutions that you've been a part of, um, each one of them in leadership role um, and talk about how each of them sort of is contributing to the broader global policy debate and what role each of them played. And let me be a little more specific. Um, what is LCPS doing that MEI isn't supposed to be doing and vice versa on the Lebanon uh, policy issue? Yeah, uh, very, very clear. I mean, LCPS, which is uh, was founded 31 years ago now, uh, and now headed by Makram Awais, was recently headed by Sami Atallah, wonderful people. Uh, in its 30-year history, LCPS began in the 90s. It was one of the pioneers to, uh, to put in the post-war arena ideas of democratic reform, administrative reform, uh, fiscal reform, anti-corruption. Uh, uh, and it really threw a bunch of ideas into Lebanese civil society from back in the 90s. Yeah. Uh, and it was also involved in establishing a number of NGOs in Lebanon, uh, like LADE, the Lebanese Association for Democratic Elections, uh, LTA, the Lebanese Transparency, the Anti-Corruption Group. Uh, it led campaigns on local government and so on and so forth. Yeah. It was behind uh, eventually the formation of what was called the Butrus Commission to change Lebanon's election law, which is arguably the most important law in any country. 
uh, and it, even and it's remained, uh, and then you've had the Hirak and the Thawra since 2019, a center which provides uh, ideas uh, that are policy, you know, rich and thought through, and is a very active player in civil society. Now, uh, as an organization that LCPS, like LCPS, is very focused on Lebanon. Uh, yes. yes, we've LCPS had some sort of Middle East wide programming and so on, but it was really Lebanon focused, which is very legitimate. Uh, uh, international organizations like the Carnegie Middle East Center that I was uh, running out of Beirut and then the Middle East Institute here in Washington, they are much more uh, international relations institutions, as like foreign policy institutions. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace is a peace research institute. It was founded before World War I uh, in order to promote uh, world peace. Uh, a lot of its o o old original thinking ended up being part of the League of Nations after World War I, and then again, United Nations. So it's been a pioneer in global peace, global governance. It was a main supporter to build the library of international law. So that was the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. It's Middle East Center, which was based in Beirut because that was one of the few places you could actually have a center, uh, was interested in uh, peace, was interested in how you can stabilize and bring peace to the Middle East, how you can reduce great power conflict in the Middle East, so it was that kind of thing. So obviously yeah. very different than LCPS. Uh, Middle East Institute, as I said, is sort of a partnership between the Middle East and uh, the United States. It's different from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Obviously, peace is one of its objectives. Sure. It's much more of a partnership. So, for example, in our Lebanon program, it's Lebanese experts and people and funders uh, reaching out to American counterparts to try to work on that. Our Palestine program is funded by Palestinian, uh, you know, uh, business people or yeah. uh, foundations, uh, our Syria program. So it's a very different model. It's trying to build a partnership and it's really more about in, uh, interstate relations than domestic reform in any one country. Okay, one, one question about Lebanon and then I want to move to your Arab uh, Futures uh, essay, which will be the, the rest, the remaining uh, time before we open up to questions. So. One of the things that was happening in 2019 um, was uh, during the, the October, uh, October uh, Thawra in, in Lebanon um, was there was a phrase for those, the, the people listening who don't know much about Lebanese uh, contemporary politics, there was a phrase being thrown around a lot and chanted kilun yani kilun, which translates to all of them means all of them um, in relation, uh, referring to we need to remove all the the politics, the entire political class needs to be thrown out. How, uh, my question uh, is, it's easy to conflate political class with the policy class. And so when uh, there are so many political analysts and political operatives that are part of, um, that are from the policy uh, circles that end up being part of the political class because they are under secretaries and they are deputy ministers and they're um, uh, supporters think uh, since you know a lot about the history of the region and you can refer to other other points in time how do we sort of navigate that what is the advice to the 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 protester on the street who is chanting kidlun yani kidlun how can we uh not throw out the the baby with the bathwater and what are the s similar comps that we can sort of look to historically or uh, geographically that can sort of inform how to figure out how to keep the policy people without keeping the political people? Yeah, I mean, the problem is the political people, not the policy people. The policy people give technical advice, Yeah, but there are six guys in Lebanon who make the decisions. Sure. Uh, in any government so far, they're the ones who decide yes or no. Um, those are the ones obviously that need to be changed. And that's what I guess meant in a sort of a general sense. Um, the main change in Lebanon, which is long overdue, is that the the society, let's describe it that way, sure. has awoken to its political obligations and its political, beginning to feel its political power. Uh, at the end of the day, all of these guys 
were recently re-elected. I mean, they weren't brought in from, you know, Mars. Mm -hmm. uh, they were elected. Now, okay, we can discuss there's election corruption, you know, nothing's ideal. Uh, but society was largely going along with this. Uh, so the challenge for, again, we're using society, obviously there's many sub-societies, I get it, sure. but just for shorthand, uh, there are two major, two or three major ways to actually bring about political change and, and remove, you know, a, a, a group of entrenched political powers and replace them with somebody else. Uh, one is revolution, uh, which we saw kind of glimmers of, you know, mass mm -hmm. protest, uh, semi-attacks against government building, you know, attacks with a small, small A, uh, you know, street power sometimes uh, uh, wins uh, and it might yet return to Lebanon, you know, who knows. Uh, uh, the challenge there is you might, you know, even if that type of ma massive street protest removes, pushes out, uh, you know, entrenched politicians, and it still could, you know, they've held on, but it still theoretically could. It's very important that you have the alternative ready to go. Uh, because obviously there's a risk of doing a revolution, removing the powers that be, and then collapsing further, uh, which we've seen obviously in, in, in many countries in the region. Uh, in that sense, when we look at the Iraq, uh, they have an obligation to take protest seriously. It's a real tool and revolution and mass protest is a real legitimate tool, but it's also important to have a clearer and more unified alternative uh, with a broad you know, set of agreement on sort of broad issues yeah. and a fairly clear set of leaders that are legitimate and empowered to take over if some major change was to take place. So that's, those are two major elements. The third yeah. major element obviously is elections. Uh, that yes, there might be some districts of Lebanon where, where, you know, without going into details are more difficult. There's more guns and stuff like that. But uh, even there, there's political life and political contestation without getting into, you know, details. But surprises happen. But in many areas of Lebanon, uh, the elections are a pretty open field. Yeah. And protest is not election. And we saw it throughout the Arab world. You know, yes, the wonderful young civil society people, yes, they led the uprisings in Egypt and in Tunisia and in Yemen and in all over the place. Uh, but they, they, like in Egypt, uh, were, were not able to at all win elections. Uh, so in Lebanon, and this, you know, something obviously all of the civil society groups are super aware of, uh, that uh, A, elections need to happen, and, you know, they might not, uh, but uh, we need to be ready for elections with a more unified set of, you know, list and more clear ideas, and most importantly, a clear set of candidates uh, that enjoy uh, strong support so that they can have a chance to win, and then through parliament you can bring about change. Fantastic. I want to just briefly at, at this point to mention this essay that you published in the spring of 2019, which is uh, all, feels like a lifetime ago, given how much has happened um, in the Middle East since. And I'm going to read uh, a few sentences from one of the paragraphs. It's called Thinking Arab Futures. You write, our current Arab world is suffering from a, quote, future deficit in that uh, Ambitious dreams for an alternative and profoundly better future have been shoved aside in favor of short-term short goals of maintaining stability and security and avoiding civil war of state or state collapse, all worthy but not transformative long-term objectives in themselves. A society needs a strong vision of its future in order to marshal national re resources and policies in a proactive and transformative uh, manner. And you introduce uh, this idea, at least an introduction to me, uh, using terms like gray rhinos and gray swans, um, and it, as opposed to black swans. And you, I, I put this on the screen, basically, it seems as though you're saying, okay, the, the reader needs to take into account there are these things called gray rhinos, which are these underlying drivers, demography changes, economic changes, land, water, climate, energy, urbanization, and technology. Then there are these gray swans, these pivot points that may hinge 
one way or another and change the course of every, everything. And then these broader geopolitical contexts, fragile states, fractured regions, global contestation. Um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how these gray swans may have changed in the last two years. And if you were to rewrite this paper now, what you may be writing differently. Uh, yeah, let me uh, first say that the two the things you you know you referred to you to the quotation in the beginning and this are are interesting and slightly different things. Okay. Uh, in the first, yeah, the first remark I made, uh, and I often say, in the past the Arabs had a future, uh, and what I mean by that that in the 1950s and 60s, uh, uh, Arab movements, Arab ideological movements, and a lot of Arab leaders had a rapport with their populations that they were presenting a very attractive vision of the future, that the future would be secular, the future would, be, uh, would have more uh, social uh, equality, uh, more, uh, more services, uh, you know, that th things would be better and the nation states would be, would be strong and so forth. Over the last 40 years, uh, 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 and a lot of the bigger states have lost uh, that vision of the future and have become defensive, closed off, backward looking, security oriented, have certainly lost that legitimacy from their people that they have some visionary future and that they've become, as I said, their promise is, okay, we'll, we'll help you avoid civil war or we will prevent ISIS from taking over, you know. That's not a very, you know, promising uh, vision. Now, there are obviously huge exceptions. UAE is a very futuristic type, you know, mm -hmm. uh, country that's very much oriented, looking 50 years down the road and being very successful at it. So what I was saying was sort of a general comment about the Arab world, broadly speaking. Uh, in the gray rhinos, so to unpack some of the animals here, the gray rhino is an obvious trend. It's sort of like the elephant in the room. Uh, we all know there's climate change happening. We all know there's demography pressures. We all know there's job deficits and all of that. We don't often look at them and say, well, hell, what is that going to mean? And how do I think 10, 15 years down the road and take these gray rhinos seriously and say, well, what do I need to do so that these gray rhinos don't trample yeah. me? The gray swans are the things you see that are liable to switch 180 degrees and could change everything. You know, if Hamad bin Salman in Saudi Arabia does something or dies, or, you know, Saudi Arabia could pivot 180 degrees. If Khamenei in Iran, the supreme leader, something happens and Iran, like Russia, you know, switched under Gorbachev, it changes everything. Those are mm -hmm. kind of gray swan. The black swan is the thing you don't see and you're not going to see coming and it might happen. Uh, some people, you know, COVID is not exactly a black swan because people have been warning against pandemics for a long time. So it may yeah. be more of a gray swan, but you didn't know when it was going to happen. Anyway, all of these... Before you keep on going on the gray swans, so Sorry? you mentioned, before you keep on going on gray swans, so you mentioned Iran, you mentioned Saudi. In the paper, you also mentioned swans upon the Nile. I'm curious, are there any new gray swans that have emerged that you wouldn't have included, but now they've emerged and you see them, you say, wow, okay, that's something that could flip. Well, I would say it's more on the gray rhino, <laughs> meaning okay. what? Meaning the pandemic uh, has, okay, obviously it was a massive and remains, continues in many countries, a massive health, uh, health crisis and has killed a lot of people and made a lot of people sick. Uh, the lasting, uh, or at least the medium term impact of the pandemic is economic. Uh, hence socioeconomic, which is, uh, if you, you know, take out certain countries like the UAE or Qatar, which, you know, are kind of able to manage, but take all the other big countries, uh, much higher uh, poverty rates, much higher unemployment rates, uh, much tighter fiscal space that the governments have less money, the economies have contracted, so the governments have less money to take care of the social issues, so uh, the Middle East countries, like most of the world, uh, in the next three, four years is emerging, you know, emerging, yes, from a pandemic, but encountering a very difficult economic and social uh, uh, burden. 
Uh, and now, and that's a gray rhino in the sense that that burden uh, could have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, unpredictable events could lead to mass protests and maybe an uprising in a country that you weren't thinking about. It could lead to a collapse of a state uh, because all of these countries and societies un are under a lot of pressure. So that's the, the pandemic created a new, you know, a more intense gray rhino, if you, if you want. Uh, the other big, I think, geopolitical change is the Abraham Accords. Yep. They've reshuffled the map of the region. Uh, I think to predict exactly what that will do is a bit hard, but it's a major, uh, uh, you know, it wasn't exactly foreseen that the UAE and Bahrain and basically Saudi Arabia would be working closely with Israel let alone Morocco and to some degree Sudan, that already has impacts, it's going to have impacts on economics, on technology, on security, certainly relating to the Gulf and Iran. Just this morning, it clearly also has impacts in the Eastern Mediterranean. The UAE now is a Mediterranean player. It With wasn't this. before. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the map has changed. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, I think, no, I would think most of these, you know, dynamics are pretty much I would say pretty much, you know, the same kind of map with a few tweaks here and there. Yeah. Okay. Um, before we go on, I just want to talk about, you're a musician. Yes, yes, indeed. And so um, before we open it up to everyone's questions, I'm curious, uh, uh, you know, how, first of all, who did you listen to growing up? Who were your main influences? And I'm going to play a little bit of the, your music in a second. But who were your main influences growing up? Wow. A uh, lot of... Inf I mean, from the Western, it was a lot of... Uh, some jazz, a lot of jazz musicians. Uh, mm -hmm. Ella Fitzgerald, uh, Al Jarreau. Especially jazz singers, but also jazz pianists. Chick Corea, who passed away recently, and many others. Yeah. Uh, I was influenced by in lyric, you know, writing songs by Elvis Costello, uh, Bob Dylan, who uh, Bob Dylan really introduced a new way of writing lyrics in the West. I mean, before then, it was all similar to Arabic music. You know, I love you, you're beautiful, this and that. Bob Dylan and then Elvis Costello and then a lot of pop music took it in a completely different direction. Yeah. And I thought, and I still think, in terms of Arab lyrics, uh, we still haven't broken through. Ziad Rahbani obviously did a lot in this area, bringing themes that weren't traditionally in Arabic music uh, uh, into Arabic music. Ziad Rahbani himself was a big influence. Uh, you know, the Arabic, uh, some of the, you know, old Arabic tradition, meaning the Egyptian, you know, tradition, but I really went back and researched, uh, you know, uh, much older uh, from Abbasid era, the complex scales, complex rhythms, because a yeah. thousand years ago, uh, Ar music in the Arab Muslim world uh, was a high art. It was like philosophy and mathematics, and yeah. uh, uh, and it was a very uh, like jazz is today. You know, it's very advanced kind of like classical music. Mm -hmm. uh, there's actually a lot in common between a thousand year old Arabic music and contemporary jazz because it's improvisational, but it's very sophisticated. Uh, and then I fell in love with Brazilian music. So, uh, and there, there's a whole world of, you know, from Jobim to Chico Buarque to Caetano Veloso. And yeah. So all of those mixes and growing up in Beirut, uh, a city of mixes, you know, a city of, 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 of civilizational, uh, you know, inter uh, dialogue, whatever you want to call it. I felt trying to write music that is, takes from Arabic, Brazilian, classical Western, jazz Western, uh, and new approaches to writing lyrics in Arabic, but in a non, not a very Arabic way, uh, was kind of an interesting thing to do. Okay, great. We are going to, I'm going to skip the four questions um, because I want to make time for everybody to ask questions. And then at the end, I'll play some of your music on the way out. So Olivia is up first. Olivia, my niece, I might uh, be very precise to say. Exactly. Olivia, your niece. What? Since when? <laughs> so my question is, in an environment that is so drained morally, financially, how can you, how can you recruit people into civic life, particularly the youth in Lebanon, in a way that's 
that's sustainable and that's relatable because we're not used to being part of the political system and we're actually quite uh, not only disenfranchised by the system but we're also repelled by the system and i think the soda created the civic awakening that i'm not sure we've known as people who are not initiated into civic life there was this burst of like civic volcano energy and then i think a lot of people are at a bit of a loss as to how to sustain it in a way that's constructive, given limited resources. Yeah, first of all, hi, Olivia, my niece. I'd love you to hear your voice. I'd love you to hear Sasha's voice here, the cutest uh, little girl that I've seen. Um, uh, let me unpack that question to two parts, uh, how to engage and recruit people today. Uh, the first part is the tragic, catastrophic economic collapse. Uh, and, you know, people, young people, they need jobs, they need to live, they need an income. And obviously, uh, it's very, very, very challenging. Uh, obviously, there's a huge brain drain going on. It is hard to convince people to stay in the country if they can't make ends meet. So there's that whole economic thing, which is pretty obvious. On the political side, I'll say a number of things. Uh, first of all, the again, putting the money crisis aside, the economic crisis, uh, sorry, the political crisis is the biggest opportunity we've had in decades. It is the crisis of a system which is, I don't know if it's completely dying, but it's certainly an, an under, you know, existential stress. Uh, it's the crisis of a society waking up to its, uh, its obligations and its needs and asking the very same questions that you're asking. Great, let's begin asking those questions. You know, for a long time, people didn't. Uh, people went about their private lives and politics was not their concern. Uh, on the question of, of disgust, Araf, uh, it's a multi-layered disgust. Uh, part of it obviously is disgust with the current political class uh, uh, part of it is, you know, the war and how the, you know, was a very ugly uh, form of politics. But I would warn that Lebanon, like most of the societies in our Middle East, we have been under, historically, our, our culture that we've developed over centuries is one of, be, of rejecting government and rejecting power because it's usually been alien power. You know, it was 500 years Turkish power before that, Mamluk power before that, you know, uh, you know, go back in history, different empires. Uh, and each, you know, whether it's Lebanon or Tunisia, you know, obviously everybody has a different history. But uh, uh, we hate government, we hate the state. Uh, that's an inherited culture over centuries, which is why we, and I dare say this, uh, we don't love paying our taxes. Uh, we we are corrupt in the sense that it's not just you know that uh, our relationship with the idea of a state by inheritance is a completely conflictual relationship. Now uh, uh, that's unhealthy because we have to we have a state uh, and we have to take it over which means we have to engage in politics, engage in protest, engage in elections, run for elections. We have to have a different cultural approach to politics and to political life and to serving in government. In the West, and this is recent in the West, I mean, if you were in the West 500 years ago, uh, the culture would have been very different. But uh, in the West, it's a point of pride that you go into government and you know you prepare yourself for government and i go back again to my years in high school when you ask people what do you want to be it was the most absurd idea for a smart young lebanese to say i want to be involved in government people would laugh at them uh, okay if you laugh at politics and policy and government you're going to get this kind of government uh, so I would say uh, we have to make our peace. We have to. Sorry, I went on too long. No, it's okay. You should have said if you laugh, if you laugh at people who you uh, who want to go into government, you're going to you're going to get clowns. You're you're good point. A good line. 
Okay, um, Ala, you're next, but I'm just going to read your question for you, and Paul, I'm going to give you a two-minute warning, okay? Um, can you speak of MEI's funders and whether funding from various MENA countries impact policy analysis on the region, particularly from countries with specific foreign policy priorities? Yeah, uh, funding is a challenge. MEI has about four sources of funding. Some of it is the endowment, which is not very big, and the interest made on that. Some of it is foundation grants that we get from places like the MacArthur Foundation, Ford Foundation, and others. Some are general fundraising uh, from uh, high net worth individuals and from corporations that contribute money during our annual gala. And part of it is from governments, either the US government through various grant opportunities or from governments in the region. The UAE currently is uh, one of the big funders of MEI. They contributed the money to build our new building. Uh, the details of our funding are on our website so you can get a very better a very uh, clearer view. Uh, the general policy of the board and of myself uh, is to maintain a strict firewall uh, between funders and whatever policy work we do, uh, and that the contributions we get, especially if they're not grants, you know, sometimes if you get a grant from the Ford Foundation or the MacArthur Foundation, it's a specific grant for a specific activity. Yeah. Otherwise, if we get contributions from governments like during our annual gala or to build a building, those are accepted on the condition of no strings attached, nothing related to programmatics. Yeah. So that's largely my job to protect my scholars and my writers uh, from, uh, from any funding concerns. But yes, it is uh, an institution that uh, uh, needs to fundraise. So it's a constant, uh, constant uh, challenge. So I would say no, uh, it doesn't really affect what, my, you know, what our experts yeah. write and you can see them writing all kinds of things. And a lot of our experts disagree with each other and will write articles against each other uh, on issues like Syria, for example, or Yemen. Uh, and that's the general principle of the institution. Okay, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna give you a softball to end us on uh, from Salma. Uh, who do you recommend for readings on post-colonialism and modernity? Wow. <laughs> uh, you called that an easy question. I can't answer that in a, qu in a quick, uh, I mean, you know, post-colonial, uh, post-modern stuff, at least if you haven't read Edward Said, you've got to read Edward Said, but there are many others. I'm actually writing a book today on modernity and the Arab world. Uh, modernity itself is a world. It's a very complex topic. Modernity, post-modernity, late modernity uh, is a very complex field itself. To what degree is the Arab world in modernity and what type of modernity is it in? It's a super complex field. It's something I'm grappling with uh, myself. So that is not an easy question. Okay, I'll, let me change the question, okay? Let me say, uh, you are speaking to a 20 year old who is interested in policy in the Arab world. What book is most likely left off their syllabus at school that they should definitely read? Uh, one of the best books, it's probably on the syllabus, but I would make sure that you read it, is the, it's called The Political Economy of the Middle East. Uh, it's in its fourth edition, and it's now, I think, or fifth edition, now going into its sixth edition. I know most of the editors of that book. Uh, I, I really would keep going back to that as a pillar of understanding the states and the economies uh, of the Middle East in a, in a very sort of detailed way and understanding its interconnection with the world. Uh, that would be the foundational book that keeps getting updated uh, on, the, on the Middle East. There's another one uh, edited by Ellen lust Aukar. Ellen lust -Aukar. Uh, I've written the Lebanon chapter in that. That's updated every year, and that covers the entire Middle East. It's one major book, uh, which is good to go to. OK. Um, Paul, thank you so much. I'm gonna play some of your music on the way out. If anyone wants to stick around and listen to it, you can um, connect with Paul and MEI through Twitter. You, their website is chock filled with information. Um, go read uh, all their stuff that they're publishing. There's really amazing stuff. Um, and Paul, thank you so much for being part of this. It was a real honor to have you on here. No, thank you, Mikey. Mikey, thank you for doing this whole Afikra effort. It's fantastic and uh, lovely to see my niece and other non-niece people uh, on the call. <laughs> Nieces and otherwise. Okay, everybody, I'm going to play a little bit of this music to take us out. 
Paul, have a great day. And Thanks. thank you, everybody, for joining. Bye-bye. Have a wonderful day and night wherever you are.